I titled the lesson this morning, An Unlikely Conversion, and I called it that because it's unlikely from a human perspective, uh, but as we will see, all things are possible with God. And we will see in this very important story the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who we come to know as Paul, the apostle. And this is such an important story in the Bible that it's told three times in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke takes us through the events in chapter 9, and then when we get to chapter 22, Paul retells how it all happened. And then again in chapter 26, when Paul stands before Agrippa, he tells again how he was saved. It's a very, very important story, and in this story we will see that no matter what kind of life anyone has lived, no one is unreachable. No one is unredeemable. And the grace of God can and does reach all people. Amen. We'll see in this story today a critically important point about the nature and purpose of baptism. And we'll be reminded that if we're convicted about Jesus, as Saul was, that conviction should lead to commitment. Conviction leads to commitment to Jesus. And so let's, let's get into the story and let's ask, who was Saul of Tarsus and see some of his background? Saul was a persecutor of the church. I have here that Saul persecuted Jesus, and you might think, well, that's odd because they, did their paths really cross? But we'll see that Paul was a persecutor of Jesus. We meet, we meet Saul in, in the end of Acts chapter 7. If you'll recall the stoning of Stephen, and we read in chapter 7, verse 58, when they had driven him out of the city, talking of Stephen, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. They laid their feet at the Apostle Paul's feet, and that shows us that he was a leader in this movement to persecute Christians. He was a leader. He was looked up to among his people. He was highly educated. He was highly respected among the Jews. And then as you get into chapter 8 of Acts, in the first three verses, we read, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But look at verse 3. But Saul began ravaging the church, ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Saul was a terrible persecutor of the people of God. And as we get into chapter 9 of Acts, we see Saul again. After the church was scattered, when Stephen was stoned, the church was scattered. They went about preaching the word of God. But we read in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, Saul was not even satisfied with persecuting the church in Jerusalem. When the church scattered, Paul chased them into a foreign country. He chased them to Damascus to drag them back to Jerusalem to stand trial for their faith. And when you look at Acts chapter 26, where Paul is retelling about his life, he says there, not only did I lock up the saints in prison, but he says, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. In 
And as I punish them often in the synagogues, he says, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Paul was was so against Christians and so hated them that he was trying to force them to blaspheme God. And you know what the punishment was for blaspheming God. He was dead set against them. Paul had a furious and a frightening zeal to wipe out the church of Jesus. But Jesus had other plans. And in what follows, we will read of the conversion of this man who suddenly went from a hater of Jesus to a faithful apostle of Jesus. We'll read of this man who went from trying to destroy the gospel of Jesus to giving up his life to preach the gospel of Jesus. So let's come back to chapter 9. Look at verse 3 with me. Paul begins, or Luke here begins to tell the story. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul says in chapter 26 that this light that surrounded him was brighter than the sun. It was blinding. You're you're seeing the glory, uh, the divinity of Jesus shining all around him. A light brighter than the sun, and they fall to the ground. And then notice that Jesus asks Saul a question in verse 5, or in verse 4. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you see that? Why are you persecuting me? Me. Jesus takes the mistreatment of his disciples very seriously and very personally. You remember when Stephen was stoned and he he looked and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus took note of what was going on. Jesus knew what was happening to Stephen and he cared deeply about that. And every believer that had to flee their homes in terror... Jesus knew about that. Jesus felt that. Every believer that Paul dragged off and put into prison, Jesus knew about that. Jesus cared about them personally. Every believer that Paul condemned to death, Jesus knew it. Jesus felt it. And isn't it good to know for you and I that when we face persecution, not if, but when we face persecution, that Jesus... He knows all about it. Jesus knows what it's like to be persecuted. He knows what it's like to be hated. Jesus cares about the mistreatment of his saints, and he takes it very personally. And so Saul is told by Jesus what he must do. Look at verse 5. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Go into the city and wait. It will be told what you have to do. Look at verse 7. Look at the effect that this had on Saul and on his companions. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. The companions of Saul, they were speechless. They, they heard the voice, but they didn't see who was speaking And Saul was blinded. Saul was was humbled by this. This this confident leader who, who thought he could ride into town victorious and impose his will on the people of God, 
He rides into town instead being led by the hand like a broken man. Saul was spiritually rocked to his core by this. You look again at verse 9. He's three days without sight. He neither ate nor drank this whole time. Saul was rocked. He was dumbfounded. And you can imagine being in his position. Everything that I believed, everything that I thought was right, suddenly it all came crashing down all around me. And I find out I was so wrong. Jesus is alive. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus is the Son of God. I've been so wrong. He's completely rocked by this. I've persecuted and I've killed God's people. And he's, he's praying. If you look over at, uh, at verse 11, the Lord said to him, get up, he's talking to Ananias, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. What do you suppose Paul was praying about? I think it probably went something like this. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, I didn't know. God, I acted in ignorance. God, please have mercy on me for what I've done to you and to your people. I think it probably went something like that, don't you? So Saul didn't only encounter Jesus on the road but we see that he chose to obey Jesus. Look with me at, again at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, about how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons, the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You see the reluctance of Ananias. He knows who this Saul is. And it's almost like he says, Lord, are you sure about this? Don't you know who this man is? And God says to him, yes, and go, because he's a chosen instrument of mine. I've chosen Saul to bear my name before, before the Gentiles, before kings, before the sons of Israel. And I'm going to show Saul how much he must suffer for my name. Go, Ananias. And we see that Ananias does go. Look at verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately... There fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. We see Saul's sight was restored. We see that he was baptized. And I want you to turn over with me. Keep your place here. That's kind of old-fashioned, isn't it? Do people do that anymore? Keep your finger here, and uh, we're going to come back to chapter 9. But I want you to turn over to chapter 22 of Acts, because we get more details in chapter 22. Remember, this story is told three times. Chapter 2 is the second time, uh, chapter 22, rather, is the second time. And we get more details about what happened here on this day. And I want to make two very important points about baptism here. Let's pick up in Acts chapter 22 and verse 12. <clears throat> uh, 
A certain Ananias, same story, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, this is Paul himself speaking, he came to me and standing near to me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him. To all, the men of, to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now look at the question in verse 16. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Two very important points about baptism here that we need to be reminded of. Number one, baptism is the point in time at which through faith in Christ, sins are washed away. Baptism is the point in time at which sins are washed away. Now let's think about this for a moment. When Saul encountered Jesus on the road, and when Saul finished his journey into Damascus, and when Saul was sitting there not eating, and he's praying, and he's not drinking anything, do you think that Saul was a believer in Christ? That's an important question. Do you think that he believed in Jesus? Do you think that he believed that Jesus was raised from the dead? Do you think that he believed that, that uh, Jesus is Lord and Master, that Jesus is the Son of God? Did he believe that? I think he believed all of that, and I think he believed it very fervently because you see it reflected in, in everything that he's doing. He's, he's praying. He's not eating. He's just rocked to his core because he knew he was wrong. So Saul was a believer in Jesus, yes. But was Saul saved? Not yet. How do we know that? He believed in Jesus, but he was still in his sins. Look again at 22.16. Look at the question that is asked. Now why do you delay Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. His sins had not been washed away. Despite his change of heart, despite his belief, Saul was still in his sins. And this shows us something very important. Once again, our sins are washed away in baptism, not before that time. One is not saved and then later decides to be baptized. That's not the biblical model. There can be no salvation for anyone unless the sins are washed away. Because it's our sins that separate us from God. Isn't that right? Our sins separate us from God. It's our sin that has earned us death, spiritual death. Isn't that right? And so Saul is told, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. There's nothing that can be more clear. Why all the debate? Why all of the questioning? Why all of the, the wondering about baptism and what it's for and what it's about? We see it right here. It's to wash away sin. And that only happens through faith in Christ. It's not magical water, right? It's only because of faith in Jesus, but I want to receive the free gift that Jesus is offering. I want to receive his grace. Well, how do I do that? And Ananias said, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name, which brings us to the second very important point about baptism. Baptism is how you call on the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. That's how, you, that's how you call on the name of God. That's how you respond to his offer for salvation. It's not praying Jesus into your heart. Now, I want to make a point about that. I think God takes note of that when somebody says, I want to belong to Jesus, and I, I, I want him to be in me, and I in him. I, I want Jesus in my life. And, and, they, and they pray to God to ask that, that Jesus would be in their life, I think God takes note of that. I think that's important to him. 
He surely notices that when God decides they want His Son, when someone decides they want God's Son in their lives. But these sincere people with sincere hearts who are seeking the Lord, they need to be told what to do, like Saul was told what to do. They need to be told what the Word of God says about how to call on the name of the Lord, just as Saul was told. What a grave disservice we do to people if we don't tell them what the Lord has said about how to call on on the name of the Lord for salvation. And we have seen the importance of baptism throughout our study in the book of Acts. We saw it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We saw it again in Acts 8 with the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. We see it here in Acts 9 and in Acts 22. Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 16, and there are many scriptures throughout the New Testament that we could list off that show us the same truth. And we must never lose the the importance of this truth. We must never be moved off of this doctrine. We must never take the word of man about how to be saved over the word of God. And if the word of God says that baptism is to call on the name of God to be saved, to have our sins washed away, who are we to tell people something else? I had someone ask me once, how does it make you feel that no denominations teach this way? That was an interesting question. And and to me, I said, "It, it doesn't concern me right? It doesn't concern me. We have to stand on the Word of God. We have to teach what the Word of God teaches, whether it's popular or not. We must hold fast to the truth. And there's so many teachings and so much confusion about this topic in the religious world. We need to be reminded from time to time. This is what the Word of God says. This is what we have to hold to as His people. Well, turn back with me to Acts chapter 9. Let's finish the story. And we will see here that Saul commits himself to Jesus. Look at chapter 9 and verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this this not Saul? Is this not the guy that was persecuting us? Everyone was amazed, but you notice that Saul, because he was so convicted after encountering Jesus, he then commits himself fully to Jesus. And immediately he begins preaching about Jesus and trying to convince people that he is the Son of God. Paul was convicted that Jesus is alive, that he is the Lord and Savior. You look at the impact that it had on his life. Paul, if you know the rest of the story about him, you know that he gave up everything to preach Christ and him crucified. He gave up wealth. He gave up worldly accolades. He gave up the world's honor to preach Jesus. He he gave up everything for persecution and poverty and imprisonment and stonings and beatings because he was fully committed to Christ. He was fully convicted about Christ. Therefore, he was fully committed to Christ. Are you? Are you fully committed to Christ? Does the good news about Jesus still touch your heart? Are you still convicted? That he is Lord and Savior. How can you know if you're still committed to Jesus? 
Well, conviction about Jesus leads to commitment to Jesus. In every part of our lives, how we live, what we value, how you view God's people, how you see people in the world, it changes everything about our lives. Conviction will lead to commitment. And yet sometimes we see very little commitment in ourselves. Sometimes the grace and mercy of Jesus is more of just a nice story than a life-changing reality to us. And so there's little commitment to holy living, to service, to worship, to the people of God. And we need to go back to the cross often, don't we? like we did this morning as we gathered around the table, and like we should do every day. We need to go back to the cross of Jesus. We need to look at the empty tomb of Jesus in our mind's eye. We need to see again his glorious ascension back to the Father. We need to think back to the day that we were baptized into Jesus and think about what that meant. Think about the commitment we made to him on that day as the one who rescued us from our sins. Do you, do you still believe it? Are you convicted about the message of Jesus? Is the gospel impacting your life? It had a tremendous impact on Paul, and so it can have with us. Have you come to Jesus for forgiveness? Have you come to him for eternal life? You know, you may think that you're too far gone. You may think that because of the life that you have lived, that you're beyond hope, that you're beyond reach. And the story of Saul of Tarsus shows us that's not true. Because he was the foremost of sinners. He calls himself that. The story of Saul shows us that no one is beyond God's reach. Saul was a violent persecutor, he was a blasphemer, he was a murderer, he opposed Jesus in every way, and yet he found grace and mercy in Jesus. And so can you. So I ask you the same question that Ananias asked Saul. If you believe in Jesus and you want to follow Jesus, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And we would love to help you to do that. And then we let him transform us. It's the beginning of a journey. We let him transform us. And do you know how many people who were so far away from God have been radically transformed by the grace and mercy of Jesus through his spirit? I've seen it happen. People radically changed and transformed by the grace and mercy of Jesus. It's not just something that happened in Bible times. It happens today. His power, uh, his grace, his power, his mercy is available to you. So if you want to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, please feel free to come now or get in touch with me anytime. Or if you need prayers this morning, please let it be known. Let's stand together now and let's sing.